right, thanks everyone. Uh, it's a, a, an honor to be here. Um, and for the next 20 minutes, I want you to put aside what you know about stroke therapies, pre-hospital management and so forth. Create an open mind and I think when you leave, you'll be inspired, I hope, that uh, you know, you'll be able to create the level of collaboration that we've implemented in South Florida. So I have no disclosures, I wish I did. <laughs> um, so this is a talk focused on stroke, but let's start with something that you already know well, a STEMI patient. So this is a timeline of a patient that experiences chest pain at home, calls 911, goes to the hospital, and then a lot of downstream actions are triggered and eventually gets treated in the cath lab to get the coronary artery open. And if you look at it, the spectrum of care from pre-hospital to in-hospital to cath lab took about two hours and 45 minutes. If that is something that is shocking to you, it should absolutely be because today, STEMI, door to balloon times, as you may well know, are down median, you know, about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, okay, at most institutions, at most PCI centers. So let's look at the stroke workflow. So a patient arrives at the hospital, generally without an EMS pre-hospital alert. Then they go to the CT scanner, perhaps stopping by in their ER bay first, spending countless minutes there, then getting the clot-busting medication if they're eligible. And then eventually, the advanced modality imaging is done if the appropriate protocols within the hospital system are in place. And ultimately, the interventionalist is called and then they're taken to the cath lab, a very sequential workflow. So it perhaps is a surprise to most of you, but to me, this is shocking that, you know, today stroke treatment is managed this way. So if we're, you know, absolutely appalled the way STEMI care, you know, might be provided, you know, two hours and 45 minutes door to balloon time, and then, you know, how can we accept a stroke workflow like this in modern day era with all the technologies that we have? So just like heart is muscle, in a stroke, time is brain, all right? So for every minute that elapses uh, in a patient that has a large vessel occlusion, meaning a large thrombus, you know, impeding flow to, you know, a big part of the brain, millions of neurons are at risk for reversible injury. And the more time that elapses because of avoidable pre-hospital and hospital delays, the worse the potential outcome for the patient. So we have to look no further than STEMI care over the last 20 years and the way it's evolved. So the pre-hospital phase especially with EMTs getting the EKG stat, faxing it over to the in-hospital team, activating the cath lab happens so quickly that everything runs in parallel. By the time the patient arrives, the cath lab team, regardless of the time of day, is already in the hospital at two in the morning versus 9 a.m., no matter what. And that patient is rushed to the lab and the artery hopefully opened up. This was an article in the New York Times last summer. There's been approximately 40% decrease in mortality rate, you know, largely due to optimizing emergency treatment protocols that includes EMS. Uh, most importantly. So this is a large vessel occlusion and a stroke. So these are the strokes that are most devastating. And for the last 20, 30 years, we've had no treatment for these types of devastating strokes. In the US, you have about 800,000 strokes per year, and approximately 250,000 or so are these large vessel occlusions. So in 1995, a clot-busting medication called IVTPA was approved by the FDA to treat strokes. The limitations were that it's a very narrow time window, just three hours. And moreover, the TPA was found to be very ineffective for treating large vessel occlusion strokes. So over time, primary stroke centers were established, you know, proficient in giving IV TPA, but if a patient presented with a large vessel occlusion stroke, the therapies were largely limited. You basically admitted that patient completely paralyzed to the ICU and then to a nursing home and left you know, permanently disabled. So over the last 15 years, we've had evolution of our stroke therapies beyond just medical treatment with IVTPA. What else can we provide? And 
We've had device after device come to the market starting in 2004. You may recall the Mercy corkscrew clot retrieval device, then a vacuum suction-like pump from Penumbra, and then ultimately third generation devices called Stentrievers. And when we studied these latest generation of devices, it was apparent, so that's the red bar there, that they're very effective at removing these clots and opening up the arteries in the brain compared to TPA alone, which is the blue bar. But as with everything, we wanted to prove it in a randomized control trial. So in 2013, the New England Journal of Medicine published three studies comparing best medical therapy at the time, which is IV TPA, compared to mechanical thrombectomy. And unfortunately, all three trials were negative. Why? Because the times to treatments were very long, the hospitals that were performing these studies were not well integrated with EMS, and therefore, the patients had bad outcomes, even though ultimately, the same type of treatment was being provided. The other notable thing was, at that time, these latest generation of devices, the Stentrievers, had not been fully approved and on the market to be included in these trials. So now comes 2015. So this is you know, still a relatively new era in stroke, ushered in after these new randomized control trials were positive, again, in the New England Journal of Medicine. So within two years, we've had a paradigm shift in stroke care First, we, you know, while I was still in training in 2013 at Mass General, I was so discouraged. I asked myself, why am I going into this field when you know, these therapies that we hope will save patients' lives keep coming out to be negative, at least in scientific research? So these trials, so the blue bars are the endovascular arms, and those were treated patients with stent trievers. And the main takeaway point here is that the time to treatment, so from the time patient arrives to doing the CT scan, making sure there's no bleed, and then going to the cath lab, groin puncture, was less than an hour. Compared to all the other trials in 2013, where the median time to treatment was 124 minutes, okay? And the ad hoc analysis showed that in these trials, the key difference was a stroke system of care that included a, you know, a very concrete, well-aligned pre-hospital phase with EMS. So these are the stent trievers. It's ushered in a whole new era of stroke care. And so now we have a renewed focus on stroke systems of care around the country and around the world. What can we do to get patients the best outcomes possible now that we have these advanced technologies available? So we have better studies. We you know, obviously aim for better patient selection in the hospital with our imaging modalities but it's fast times to treatment, and that involves integrating EMS. Without EMS, we cannot do it. So need for speed and acute stroke right now is the hot button topic, it's paramount. And Hussein Bolt, obviously many of you know him, you know, he can run a 100 in less than nine seconds flat, but most of the hospitals in this country, unlike you know, these runners, they are way behind in their protocols for stroke care, okay? And so the ability to achieve rapid reperfusion in the cath lab is very critical right now, but we have to step back and back to the basics of you know, what's important in the pre-hospital care first. So these are all the different steps I've outlined in terms of you know, what we did in South Florida to get patients from the field, from their home via EMS, to the lab as quickly as possible. And if you look at all these steps, look at the ones that involve EMS, okay? So revising the triage protocols, you know, implementing a large vessel occlusion stroke scale, uh, new technologies that I'll mention, and ultimately optimizing the workflow in the hospital. So the first is stroke education. So recognizing the signs and symptoms of a stroke in the community, that work for educating the community falls on the hospitals in the region as well as EMS. And so the FAST campaign came out several years ago to educate potential stroke patients, you know, that, look, if you have facial droop, arm weakness, speech, then immediately call 911. Because the data showed that 60% of stroke victims wait more than an hour before they call 911 to get to the hospital. And by that time, when the TPA time window is so narrow, you may be well out of the time window for any acute intervention. And so 
The next thing we did is deploy the EMS large vessel occlusion stroke scales. This is the workshop we held yesterday with Dr. Peter Antavi and Mark Ellis. It was very well received. We reviewed all the large vessel occlusion stroke scales and the feedback was amazing. These are scales that just went you know, live over the past year or so, published in the literature, validated, and we implemented this in South Florida. This is a scale that not only includes the face weakness, the arm weakness, and speech deficits, but moreover, what we call cortical signs. So cortical signs are those where blood flow in the brain is so compromised that it's likely due to a large vessel occlusion, that the patient's having complete hemineglect, hemiplegia, and global aphasia, meaning they can't talk, they can't follow any commands. And obviously, the most important one that confers a LVO is gaze preference, deviation of the eyes to one side or the other. If any of those signs or symptoms are present, we instructed our medics immediately just call a stroke alert to the hospital, and then we'll alert the cath lab downstream. So by the time EMS arrives, this basically has become our EKG. Okay, so that cath lab is activated in parallel and can achieve rapid reperfusion and hopefully save lives. So the next step was, okay, we have great stroke scales. How do we use those to impact triage criteria? So in this country, we have stroke capable hospitals that may be able to provide IVTPA, but such a narrow time window. Then there's thousands of primary stroke centers that are JCO certified, but only a handful of comprehensive stroke centers. So for that reason, we had to instruct them that look, based on the scale, triage either to a PSC or a CSC, and to avoid interfacility transfer delays, if you are you know, uh, suspecting a potential LVO based on the scale, just go immediately to the CSC. And that saves countless minutes and millions of neurons in return. So the next step was, you know, look, we can be a guide to EMS because all of this is so new, hot off the press, that let's assist you in getting these patients to the appropriate treatment facilities. So as soon as I joined Memorial Healthcare System in 2014, I gave every EMS agency in our region my cell phone number. In fact, I made this wallpaper that they could install on the home screens of their smartphones so that if they had a stroke patient, immediately they knew who to call. And we would fire up FaceTime, something so simple. These apps are available on our phone for daily use for socializing. Why not use it to save lives? And the next step was the power of activating a stroke alert just you know, with your fingertips, right? So innovative apps such as Pulsera, where you enter in just a few fields and immediately all the downstream stroke team members in the hospital get alerted including the ER physician, the nurses, the CT techs, the cath lab techs, whoever you want in this pathway based on the process at a given hospital can be part of this uh, system. And we have utilized it for the past year and I think it holds a lot of promise in streamlining workflow, improving communication, and ultimately uh, the outcomes uh, for stroke patients. So there are apps like Tuyage that allow for EMS tracking if we can order a cab using our smartphones, a black car via Uber, and see exactly this location up to the point that it reaches you, why can we not do that with EMS agencies and the ambulances? The technology is there. It's all about implementation and a way that the user interface makes sense to the person in charge. So mobile stroke units, I saw there was a ambulance here parked uh, you know, for the demo. I think this is, uh, such new technology, great concepts on the horizon. In my opinion, excellent for rural communities where perhaps the nearest primary stroke center may be miles away and you are able to obtain a stat CT scan while en route in the ambulance and send that via televideo, telemedicine to the receiving hospital and they can, you know, real time interpret the scan, feed back to EMS and deliver a clot busting medication within the golden hour for IVTPA. So I think technologies like this are excellent and you know, are being actively studied in areas such as Cleveland and Houston. Within the hospital, imaging is paramount. All of our decisions are made based on what does the scan show? What does the CT show? What does the CT angiogram show? In order to quickly decide, 
I should not have to be at my desktop, you know, in the middle of the night or whether I'm out with my kids and, you know, be limited to access to imaging. So if we are, again, able to order a Starbucks coffee from the palms of our, you know, uh, at our fingertips, why not put imaging in the same frame, right? Because ultimately, the quicker I can access such tools, the faster I can make that decision and be in-house and ready to treat the patient. This is the pathway we've implemented. This was published uh, in Journal of Neurointerventional Surgery. And it's basically, you know, the first 15 minutes, you know, once you receive the EMS pre-hospital alert, get that patient straight to CT, bypass the ER bay, make that decision for IVTPA within the first 30 minutes, and then go straight to the cath lab. In today's process of, you know, stroke systems, this type of parallel workflow is almost unheard of. Yes, there are pockets of areas throughout the country that are practicing this way, but ideally what we would all love to see is with EMS integration that every system in the country, every comprehensive stroke center is performing at the highest level possible so that no matter where you triage your patients, ultimately they receive the best care. So what have we achieved as a result of EMS integration? Data is king, right? So let the numbers do the talking. So the farthest left bar is if in the hospital, you know, patient arrived and there was no EMS alert and found to have a large vessel occlusion, the time to get that patient to the lab and groin puncture was 71 minutes. Now, if you look at the far right, if you have EMS alert and with the LVO scales that I have a high pretest probability, I activate the lab and the time is more than half, okay? So you can see that the numbers are drastically reduced just simply by pre-hospital alerts. And data shows that for every 30 minute delay in time to reperfusion, the likelihood of a good outcome for patients is reduced by around 20%. So you can imagine older patients, their stroke is evolving quickly, especially our elderly population in South Florida, these minutes matter. And the more we integrate and align ourselves with EMS, the better the outcomes. So here's a prime example, a 74 year old, that arrived completely paralyzed on one side, CT scan was done immediately on arrival because we had the EMS alert, and you can see the clocks at the top, they do the talking, right? So to cath lab in less than 30 minutes, to groin puncture in less than 45 minutes, and the artery opened within an hour. We're achieving the same workflow that STEMI patients receive. So there should not be any difference, no variability between a heart attack victim and a stroke victim in terms of timely care in the new era of mechanical thrombectomy. Here's another patient. This individual was out golfing. You know, he's a snowbird visiting from New York and completely just went limp on one side. Call 911 and guess what? His wife was a former dispatcher for EMS. She immediately recognized the signs and symptoms got the patient to the hospital while in parallel doing a pre-hospital stroke alert, and we had that patient in the lab within less than 30 minutes, and the artery opened up. And his whole carotid artery was blocked all the way to the terminus, so stented it, took out the clot with one of these stent trievers, and the patient was back golfing two weeks later. These types of outcomes were unheard of, you know, just even five years ago, okay? So, it takes a team, all right? We cannot do this in silos just at our hospitals. Integration with EMS is paramount. And so I hope that this talk has inspired you to go to your regions, to your hospitals, and ask them what are our protocols, what is the process, because now it's a whole new era in stroke care. Thank you very much.